benefit spending is an unusually difficult budget line to control. Whoever wins the election will need to contend with this extremely unpredictable cost. Now, the coalition says it saves £21 billion a year through its changes. But what's actually been happening? To listen to our politicians, you'd think that the whole issue around welfare was around a few small neighbourhoods with high unemployment, places like Ladywood here in Birmingham, where workless people were soaking up huge amounts of cash. Ladywood was the site of a Channel 4 documentary about working age benefit recipients, which helped set that tone. Benefit Street epitomised how welfare is often portrayed. So I've been knocking on doors here to try and find out what exactly people think about their portrayal a year on. And two things are very striking. First of all, we knocked on a lot of doors and almost no one answered. It's the middle of the working day, so they're either out at work or they're very keen not to talk to us. And that's possible because the second thing we've observed is the people who will speak are very angry. One lady told us here about how she'd had abuse shouted at her in the street just for living here, and she's very worried she won't be able to sell her house. Furthermore, the Benefit Street view misses the big picture on benefits. You can think of the combination of taxes and benefits as doing two different things. One is a Robin Hood function, which is people who've got higher incomes pay in more, people who've got low incomes get more out at that particular moment. But the majority of what it does is like being a giant piggy bank that we pay in through our working lives, through our taxes, income tax and national insurance, and we get out mainly after retirement, but also like an insurance company when things go wrong for us. So where do we spend the bulk of our 200 billion pound plus benefit bill? Well, helping with the cost of children, that's 37 billion pounds. Helping people on low incomes, 34 billion pounds. People with illnesses and disabilities, 36 billion pounds. Unemployed people, four and a half billion pounds. And benefits for older people, 93 billion pounds. But cuts haven't fallen evenly. We have the famous triple lock for pensioners where your state pension goes up by the best of earnings prices or two and a half percent. Whereas the tone of discussion for the working age population is that if, the work, if, if, if wages fell, then so should your benefits. Now, benefits didn't rise when, when wages were rising in real terms. So it's almost turning to the working age population and say, you'll get the worst of prices and earnings. So, for example, benefits aimed at working age people are cut by the equivalent of £5.3 billion this year alone by making payments less generous than they otherwise would have been. Similarly, child benefit restrictions and cuts saved £3.7 billion a year. Pensions and pension credit payments, however, were made a billion pounds a year more generous. Over this parliament we've seen big changes to the benefit system for working people. In housing benefit, for example, it's become less generous and in tax credits we're seeing that people are able to get less support when they're on a low income. And those policy changes also um, need to be considered in the context of bigger changes in the labour market. We've seen a growth of self-employment, we've seen more agency work, shift work, zero hours contracts. And in the housing market we've seen pressure on the private rented sector, rents going up. So the people who we see at Citizens Advice are struggling with a combination of these problems. Now those labour market changes drove a surprising fall in job seekers allowance claims, saving an unexpected £326 million in 2014-15. But high house prices drove the housing benefit bill up by £3 billion more than expected, to £24.5 billion overall. The coalition also sought to get people off sickness benefits, like incapacity benefit, and into work. The work capability assessment was really an attempt by the government to work out whether in fact people were capable of work, and if they weren't, whether with help they would be capable of work. So that should, in the end, mean that more people would be in work because the assessment would be fairer for everybody and you wouldn't have people languishing on support. But look at these graphs showing projections for the cost of incapacity benefits. In 2011, the bill was projected to start falling imminently. And in 2012. And in 2013. But it hasn't. Here is the latest forecast. The coalition is £3 billion a year off its original target to cut the cost of IB to under £10 billion. When I was brought in as the first independent reviewer, it seemed to me that though the process, the principle behind the process was correct. There was something wrong with every step of the process right the way from the first telephone call to the claimant right through if necessary to appeal. 
and it was mechanistic, it was driven by the fact that they thought this computer program would solve all their problems and you wouldn't have to involve too many human beings in it and yet you were dealing with human beings and they're individually different and it just seemed to me it would, it would lost all humanity. The coalition planned to spend only £203 billion in 2014-15 but actually spent £215 billion. Big coalition reforms like the universal credit have yet to really take flight and measures like the under-occupancy penalty or the bedroom tax only saved £500 million. So Tory and Lib Dem plans to cut the benefit bill do need to be viewed with caution. For them, as for Labour, welfare overshoots could eat deep into other budget lines.